Welcome everyone. We just uh, opened up the Zoom room and we have people filing in. I'm just going to give it um, a few seconds here and let some more people join in. We're going to um, start in just a just a little bit here. We're letting people file in. We just opened the, the Zoom room. I'm going to give it um, another minute. And um, then we'll get moving. This is uh, Nicole Francis. And uh, as you're logging in, um, we'd love to know where you're logging in from, um, what community or nation you're from. I'm over here in uh, Wabanaki territory, Penobscot specifically. And it is about one o'clock where I'm at today. It's beautiful and sunny out. And as you introduce yourself, that'll let us know too that um, that we have the chat open for everyone um, so that we can interact with everyone. All right, great. I'm seeing someone joining from Minneapolis. All right, welcome everyone. Quick way, my name is Nicole Francis. And I'm going to be moderating the webinar today, the Restoring Health for Healthy Futures. And um, I'm being joined by Mariah, who is working in tech. So you can communicate with both of us and let us know if something's going on in the chat. Um, if it's not getting through or if anything's going on with the sound, just go ahead and, and put that in the chat room and we'll, um, we'll take care of that. And for any people that are coming in, let us know where you're logging in from, what nation or community you're from, um, even how you heard about the event. That would be great, too. Um, and I am, like I said, I'm logging in from Wabanaki Territory, uh, specifically from Penobscot Territory. Um, I am Mi'kmaq, from Asipatrick First Nation, or from Aristogan and Mi'kmaq, now known as Mi'kmaq Nation. And we're welcoming you today to the uh, webinar Plant Teachings, Connecting Children with Plants, Local Landscapes and Cultural Traditions webinar featuring Mariana Harvey. And I'm really excited to have Mariana here uh, today uh, to talk to us about their personal and community experiences. This is the fourth webinar that we have with the Restoring Health for a Healthy Future webinar series. It's hosted by Native American Food Sovereignty Alliance in partnership with Traditional Native American Farmers Association. And I'll just uh, give you um, some info on both of these organizations. NASA is an organization dedicated to restoring the food systems that support indigenous self-determination, wellness, cultures, values, communities, economies, languages, and families while rebuilding relationships with the land water, plants, and animals that sustain us. Um, I've had really amazing um, experiences with NASA and um, felt very supported through their work in my own food sovereignty work that I do. And uh, TNAFA, or the Traditional Native American Farmers Association, Association's mission is to revitalize traditional agriculture for spiritual and human need by creating awareness and support for Native environment issues. And um, I've also loved following and uh, being part of uh, TNAFA's work with Clayton Nebraska Pay um, and supporting this webinar for one and also being involved in uh, the Indigenous Design course that he gives every year, which is two weeks of, um, of training uh, in land-based learnings uh, that they do in New Mexico. Uh, that one just finished up and that's really amazing too. If you get a chance to check out uh, TNASA's uh, website and NASA's website, um, there's also previous recordings for the other webinars that we had previously to this that you can check out there. And um, together, NASA and TNASA are pleased to bring to you this uh, this webinar. And I'm going to hand it over to Mariana to introduce themselves and um, and start off with um, some slides and. Um, and letting us know about their work. The Kumaiski, Inknash Maniksha, Mariana Harvey, Washnash Yakma Kinnik. Good morning. My name is Mariana Harvey. I'm a citizen of the Yakma Nation. And um, 
Matla Nushamash, thank you for inviting me uh, to, to share today and to really hosting these webinars. I watched the, the last two on recording um, or the first two and were really inspiring. So I feel honored to be invited into this space and uh, to be with you all today. Uh, my parents are Ken and Patty Harvey and my grandparents on my mother's side are the late Erna and Wesley Moline. And on my uh, father's side, my paternal grandparents are the late Emma Whitefoot and the late James Harvey. And um, on my father's side, um, I'm Yakima, uh, my, my uh, bands are Skinpa and Clickitat, and I'm also uh, Titanapum and Black. And then on my mom's side, I'm Swedish. Um, and I'm coming here today from the uh, Medicine Creek Treaty Tribes uh, of the Squaxin Island, uh, also currently known as Olympia, Washington, um, at the bottom of the Salish Sea here in the Pacific Northwest. And um, <clears throat> I work as the Wild Foods and Medicines uh, Tribal Relations Lead at GRUB here in Olympia. And GRUB stands for Garden Raised Bounty. And it's an organization that has many different things it's doing um, outside of the Wild Foods and Medicines program. There's a veterans program that supports uh, uh, veterans um, coming out of service with growing backyard gardens, beekeeping. Um, and we have a youth program that supports young people who are earning, earning their GED and they learn uh, how to grow food on the farm. We have a three acre farm um, uh, and then getting leadership skills while um, also earning their GED. And our program, we're going to share a little bit about all the resources that we have. So I'm here um, in this webinar to really just share about my own story my story as an itla, which is mom, and the resources that we have to connect kids uh, with plants and foods and medicines in, in our landscapes. And so that's um, my role today. And I think I pass it back to Nicole and Mariah. Thanks so much, Mariana. Uh, we are going to be doing a draw a little bit later. So um, as as people are logging in um, towards the the end of the of the presentation, we'll be doing a draw that um, Clayton Braskape he likes to get uh, a uh, a goodie bag sent out to to someone uh, from the attendees, and we'll pick that name randomly. Uh, he likes to to send that off. Um, it could have very, various ancestral foods that, that he grows or has access to in New Mexico. And uh, we will be doing the question and answer at the end, but feel free to keep the conversation going in the chat. Um, and we will keep track of things mm -hmm. in there as well. Uh, and um, at, the, at the end, we'll be able to uh, move into uh, Q&A. Did you have anything to add, Maria? I might have forgot. Oh, ah, no. Okay, you can hear me. Um, no, so I will stop sharing my screen. So, Mariana, you can um, start sharing yours. Thanks for joining, everybody. Yay, we're here to talk about everything I love to talk about. I talk about my own kids and plants and how they transform our lives. Um, can everyone see my screen? Just need Yes. Okay, good. There were some snafus earlier. Um, so we're here um, to talk about um, a couple of curricula I shared and, you know, connecting, connecting kids with, with place. And I'll share a little bit of my own stories on that path. And I like to always share like my, my journey into tribal food sovereignty really started with Buffalo. Um, I was a student at Fort Lewis College in Durango, Colorado, and I got connected um, with a student run, a native student run organization called Buffalo Council. And there the students were bringing Buffalo to the school. And as an intertribal student body, uh, harvesting, harvesting the buffalo, learning how to tan the hides, and then we'd have a big uh, buffalo feast, a big community feast. And so I joined right before they had their first feast and um you know it was 
the tail end. So they were brushing out the hide, getting it ready for the feast. They had already harvested the buffalo and they were handing the meat out to all the people in our community that, you know, could cook and had everybody come um, and bring their dishes to the day of the feast. And at the feast we held at our college, you know, it was, um, we had maybe three to 500 people there. It was, you know, the student body, local native communities, broader community. And what was so powerful, the many things that were powerful about it for me was um, how unifying it was for all these different people to come and, and around, around this relative, around Buffalo. And um, we had heard so many positive stories. Like I had a friend that came and he was like, you know, I came here like upset. I had had this drama with one of my friends and we sat down and we were eating the Buffalo and it was like the Buffalo just changed, changed it. Like we were, we were like talking to each other afterwards. We had many people come up to us and say, we've never tried this you know, native and non-native people being like, we've never tried Buffalo and it's amazing. Like, thank you for doing this. And we just had all these positive stories. And then my own positive experience of like watching the unification of, you know, this diverse group of people, um, and really for us as an intertribal student body, you know, that, you know, of course, Buffalo historically have this huge range across North America. Um, so many of us, though, we've come from these really diverse um, tribes are all unified by, by Buffalo and learning together about um, traditional practices uh, from, from all of our different backgrounds on how to care for and cook and butcher and all the things. And Another background of why that was so powerful because, um, or like how it kind of changed my perspective on, on what, what positive impact and activism can look like. Um, I went to college um, and studied American Indian Studies uh, because of my experience in high school. I went to uh, high school in Seattle, Washington, where I grew up, and our mascot was Indians. And it was... Um, a group of uh, a small group of native women students, including myself and my sister uh, worked to change the mascot at our high school. And so my experience, that's that, that experience really radicalized me in terms of like what, how to affect positive change, how to make change, you know, you know, having a voice and being backed by community. And, um, but what I thought change meant was like, I have a blow horn and I'm out protesting and, um, it was very oppositional. Um, and, and when I attended, um, and just to wrap that story up, it, it, we did, we were successful in 2002, Seattle public schools voted to ban all native mascots. Um, and, um, and that was a very much a community led effort. And that effort led me into like, I want to keep working on behalf of our communities. I want to, um, make affect positive change for our tribes. And, and so I was really interested in resistance movements. And so when I joined the Buffalo council and witnessed the, like the positive impact and transformation that I experienced and other people experienced just eating our traditional foods is like what radicalized me into tribal food. So she was like, Oh my God, I want to learn everything. Like I, so, um, transformed. And so I always like to say Buffalo changed my life, connected me to my partner, the father of my children. And, and it led me to my traditional foods. And so um, I went uh, back home. So I was, you know, there in Colorado and I went back home and, um, and of course I uh, started asking my own community, like, you know, more about our traditional foods and medicines and life ways. And um, like I shared, I grew up in Seattle, so I'm a second generation urban native. Uh, my father was raised in Tacoma, Washington, um, still raised in our native community. You know, he would go over um, to Yakima all the time, um, visit, visiting family and um, was raised right there in the Puyallup tribal community in Tacoma. And then I was raised in Seattle in our vibrant uh, urban native community and still would always be connected to our families um, in Yakima, going over for holidays and family birthdays and gatherings and but whenever I go to the longhouse it was mostly just for um, funerals and memorials and I really didn't know much about um, our traditional foods 
and all of our feasts and first foods feasts that we do until um, until I started really asking. Um, and so I went home and started going to our first foods feasts and gathering with our longhouse, gathering our traditional roots and berries and learning there. And then on the west side where I was still living. So for those outside of the Northwest, there's always like the Cascade Mountain Range here in the Pacific Northwest. There's the east side, the plateau, which is where uh, Yakima is and many other tribes. And then on the west side where I'm at right now and where I was raised is mostly a Coast Salish region. And, um, and so I was going over to Yakima and then I was coming back um, here and finding really amazing plant teachers here. And, um, and learning and taking different workshops and just filling up my, filling up my spirit. I just, I was, um, you know, in love with, with, um, the gift of our foods and medicines and how it was impacting me. Um, and I, uh, also was working for this native youth organization, um, called Native Youth Leadership Alliance. And we did, lots of things and um, did workshops. And so I was like learning different things um, about plants and medicines and sharing in our, our workshops. But one of our values in our, um, in that organization was um, really breaking cycles. Like, you know, of course with everything, when we want to work, break cycles, we're working with our young people. And so we wanted to, our, you know, our values were around, you know, wellness and balance and how to support young people in creating those things for themselves and really naming what self-care looks like for them and, you know, bringing in traditional foods and bringing in healthy lifestyles. And so that whole kind of concoction was brewing in my life um, before I became an Ipla, a mom. And um, when, when I was pregnant, um, I just became so inspired to bring all this culmination for my children, you know, like what children are our best teachers and, and they also encourage us to do our best, you know, like to try our hardest. And I think for native families, when, when I witness and really just speaking for myself, um, trying our best often includes our culture. So that meant, you know, every time I was um, eating some of our traditional foods when I was pregnant, like, knowing that the, my baby's palate can be shaped by what I eat, you know, just like honoring that food that's nourishing them in my womb. Um, you know, I started to try um, even harder to learn some of our itch skin, our Yakma language. And my partner is uh, Mashika and Apache, and he was learning a lot of his Nahuatl language. And, um, and then when our son was born, our first son, you know, we, we, spoke the most language we ever have in our home, even if it was like words here and there and a few phrases, like it's because our children make us try our best. And I think um, that's one of the many gifts they give us in our life. And so this is a collage of, of my kids. I have a four and a half year old and a, and a one or 14 month year old sons. And, um, and this is, this is my life. This is my life. Um, we uh, we do our best to to follow our foods and to um, teach them on the land. And so, you know, I know in our communities, um, we'll hear like our foods are our leaders, and we follow our foods. And so, that's uh, one of the one of the ways that I try to bring our foods into our family. It's like my at the bottom middle picture is my son Tamna, which is heart. Um, he has a little salmon berry to Tumsli. And that's when he was born. He was born um, uh, here in our region. Uh, salmon berry is usually ready in like June. It's one of the first berries for this side of the mountains. Um, and so this is him one years old eating, eating one of his first uh, Tumsli berries. Um, and um, so I, I'm mostly uh, going to share about the resources that we have, and I'll leave in some of my stories. But, um, you know, children, children are naturally connected um, to nature. Uh, right now, that my 14-month-old month Tumna, um, anytime I open the door to the outside, he cries if he doesn't get to go outside. 
And immediately, if he does go outside, he's soothed. He's immediately soothed by nature. And I love that. And I love like talking to other families and I'll hear the same stories um, around how, um, you know, just being outside, our children are are more regulated. They're they're happier. They're they're literally soothed by by just being outside. And um, and how that's just a natural way of being. And <clears throat> we um, the work that we're doing. Um, I'm going to share a little bit about um, a couple of our two resources that I'm going to share about. And um, this is just a little background story of like, I love plants, I love foods and medicines and, and just their potential to transform us. Um, that's why I wanted to share how Buffalo transformed me because um, there's just so much um, impact and transformation that I, I believe can happen when we start connecting um, ourselves and, and of course our, our baby and children kids or young people to the earth and give that sense of belonging and connection and um, responsibility. And so um, I'll get into the, the, the resources that we have in terms of how do I do this in community? So 10 Gather Grow is a youth-centered teaching toolkit on native and wild plants um, as food medicine and traditional technologies. This is a really robust uh, K through 12 curriculum. And here in Washington, it's aligned with next generation science standards. Um, people have been adapting this toolkit from early childhood all the way into like, you know, elders community programs. It's meant to be really adaptable. And um, it, uh, like I shared, is pretty robust. It's like 500 plus pages. And um, and we've been working on it since 2016. This is our group um, of about 12 people that started this. It's for a group of native and non-native people. Some of us are nutritionists, dietitians, ethnobotanists, herbalists, community educators, science classroom teachers, public health uh, advocates, youth you know, development experts, and um, we came together to start working on this because many of the people that were part of um, that that were part of this core group worked at Northwest Indian College in their traditional plants program, and in that program they did lots of workshops uh, around plants and medicines, and and they would hear often from tribal communities how they wanted something for young people that they were like, this is amazing, this is lovely, and. It would be amazing to have something that's really geared towards young people so that we get them connected early. And so that's sort of like how we got connected to um, starting this, this uh, curriculum was uh, hearing that community need. And um, our curriculum, it's, it's a, it's a place-based curriculum and it includes Northwest Native culture and plant traditions, um, and it's really meant to uplift movements for uh, tribal sovereignty, cultural, reclam cultural reclamation, um, and really encourage non-Native communities uh, to live more respectfully and sustainably in relation to the earth and natural world, and to be allies in support of tribal, uh, tribal sovereignty. And so it's designed, um, like I said, by Native and non-Native people, and it's meant for Native and non-Native people to use. And our, of course, our core audience um, who we write it for um, was for tribal youth. And um, so, yeah, goals to promote our health, our connection to land, um, social emotional skills. We actually have a sister curriculum that I'll share, too, called Plant Teachings for Growing Social Emotional Skills. Um, and really increase our individual and community uh, resilience. And it's organized in modules. So the <clears throat> um, first module is our plant guide. And the plant guide is consists of 20 plants. And each plant, they're native and naturalized. So like wild or naturalized plants that are um, not native, but have become naturalized here, like cleavers and dandelion and plantain. And um, so we highlight um, 
each of those plants and each of those plants have anywhere from like one to four lessons. And um, so dandelion, you know, might have uh, four lessons because there's so many things to do. And ironwood, I think, has just like one lesson. And the plants are really focused on the region here, the um, the Western um, Washington, Pacific Northwest. So um, people have been adapting this and using it in Alaska on the plateau side and other places because there's some plants in there like rose, rose around the world, yarrow, nettle, like places. Those plants have such a wide range um, and people kind of pick up um, what they like from that plant guide. And cultural ecosystems field guide. I'm going to get a little bit diver deeper, dive deeper into that in another slide. Um, but that's one module. And um, herbal apothecary is all things medicine making. So uh, we go into like internal remedies, um, like peas and shrubs and herbal vinegars, herbal honeys, and then um, kind of like first aid plants. So um, making poultices, making um, salves and chest rubs and lip balms and herbal oils, and really just calling out that, you know, allopathic Western medicine hasn't been around that long. It's, you know, our herbal plant medicine has been around uh, for thousands of years and how our ancestors, all of our ancestors um, worked with plants and connected um, and, and use them as medicine. And, you know, not to say that there's not a place, of course, for allopathic uh, Western medicine, um, but herbal apothecary is just helping people re-remember um, the gifts of plants in our, in our medicine chests and apothecaries. Wild food traditions is all things um, cooking and, um, and eating with foods uh, or traditional foods, wild foods. So it starts, it's a seasonal, round so it starts with uh spring greens so like how to we'll do a spring greens block and identify you know the ones you might find in your garden like chickweed and um uh dandelion and also ones that we might gather like nettles and how to cook with them different recipes and uh, we have wild berries and there's like that's a really fun toolkit there's berry bingo in there and um and then uh, the last one is uh, healthy beverages and snacks. And it's really about how to rethink our drink um, and all the different herbal beverages that we can have instead of Red Bull and pop. And, <clears throat> and then tree communities is one that um, uh, is on evergreen conifers and deciduous trees. And so this one um, we often do like in the winter time and we'll make lots of um, fun medicines with evergreen conifers, like cedar soak, uh, cedar, cedar soaking salts and um, herbal chest rub and, and um, or cottonwood bud oil uh, with the deciduous trees and just really looking at uh, how trees teach us to be healthy and resilient. Um, this is this is uh, one module where we bring in a little bit more of our uh, social emotional learning because trees, you know, for evergreen conifers in our region, they've been around here since the time of dinosaurs. And, you know, what, think of all, you know, dinosaurs aren't here or all the other relatives that aren't here anymore, um, plant or otherwise. And here we still have our Douglas firs and our cedars. And what has helped them be resilient? What has helped them adapt to um, the ever-changing climate um, that they've survived thousands of years? And so um, we, we look into that a little bit in there. And, and then plant technologies is all plants that are um, useful in our life. So, you know, we learn how to make cordage and um, some simple weeding techniques and just... Um, the different ways that we use plants as traditional technologies. And so that's, that's a very high level of what is in our curriculum. And um, let's see, let me get, so how do we hold this up? How do we lay a foundation of integrity for this work? Um, 
you heard me say that this is this is open for anybody um, to use this. And so um, we acknowledge like the inherent tension of, of sharing any type of plant knowledge outside of our communities. And um, I, we always like to, you know, kind of share that um, there's much more that isn't in this curriculum. There's many, many things, um, plants or uh, traditions around plants that are not in the curriculum on purpose. Um, and we acknowledge that our, in our communities that, you know, really wealth, um, knowledge is wealth. And, you know, there's some of that knowledge that may just be held in a, in a family, or maybe there's knowledge that's just meant for a tribal community. And then there's public knowledge. There's knowledge that's outside of community. And so in our curriculum, um, we've been guided by several elders and cultural specialists and have reviewed our curriculum for um, what's safe to share um, broadly. And although we're sharing um, outside of our communities, um, we still want to make sure that that anybody that's using the curriculum still really recognizes the gift um, that it is. And so um, in our 10 Gather Grow Teacher Guide, um, we really spell that out. We spell out, you know, um, honoring cultural property rights. We speak directly to non-Indigenous educators and how to um, <clears throat> share this with integrity and different strategies. And um, um, of course, harvest safety and ethics. There's um, the plants that are in the curriculum aren't at risk. And the ones that are um, are there just for um, promoting that restoration. So camas is one that's in there because it's such a big teacher for us. Our camas, um, for those that don't know camas, it's a, it's a bulb that grows here in prairies. And um, I'll share more about it. <laughs> Um, in another slide, but it's it's um, we we include ones like that with the specificity of like directly saying this is not for non-tribal people to gather. You should still know about this important prairie plant because we need to protect our prairies, and <clears throat> it's not for you to harvest. Um, so we try to spell out those things. Anybody that uses the curriculum has to read our teacher guide, and then we have a video. Um, they're honoring plants, places, and cultural traditions that really lifts up the key points from the teacher guide. And then later I'll share that we have this curriculum portal where all of this lives for you to have access to, and you have to read the guide, watch the video, and then take a quiz to make sure you actually did it because, you know, because we had to do that. Um, and then you can have access. And that's just, that's just what we could work with. We're open to... <clears throat> other ways, but um, we share this outside of our community because, you know, we know that um, people, people need to be connected. They need to learn from our plants as teachers. And um, here in Washington State, we have the Since Time of Memorial Tribal Sovereignty Curriculum, which um, really is an amazing curriculum um, that uplifts tribal sovereignty and has, a, you know, really extensive stories about all the different tribes here. And um, one of our, um, one of the teachers that we were going into her classroom often in sharing 10 Gather Grow, she was doing a um, teacher training on this since time of memorial sovereignty curriculum training. And so she's in this, you know, big auditorium with several teachers that she works with. And she was telling them, you know, if you're not teaching this curriculum, you're contributing to our erasure. If you're not teaching our students about tribes. And it was impactful when I heard that because I felt like that's applied here too. Like, you know, cedar is such an important tree here in our region and, you know, has carried people in all of our traditions from birth to death and our housing, our canoes, our clothing, all, all kinds of things that Cedar has um, gifted us. And so if you're sharing about the gifts of Cedar and then you don't even mention Native people in our since time of memorial, you know, co-evolutionary, you know, type of relationship that we have with this tree, it also contributes to our erasure. And so it's important for, um, you know, <clears throat> people to be connected um, 
to the importance of these plants and our relationship. So some of the principles are um, the culturally responsive teaching I already shared. You don't have to be an expert. You know, people pick this up and you don't have to know everything about plants. You just, you just have to try. Um, we really encourage people to teach and learn outside, but we have it set up where, you know, these are lessons you can teach inside. Um, uh, and I'm going to get to some of the other points as I go along. And so here's the plant guide, some of the plants. Um, and so cultural ecosystems, I guess, that I mentioned this a little bit more. Um, there are places, landscapes that include and require human involvement um, for them to continue to exist. And, you know, Native people, we've always stewarded um, our lands. And these cultural ecosystems are the places that really wouldn't be here without our involvement. And so Camas Prairies, uh, which is you're seeing the beautiful purpley blue flower, um, is the, the flower of Camas. Um, they wouldn't be here without our involvement. They are um, a grow on our prairie. They're also known as Gary Oak Prairies. And um, they need fire, regular fire, to um, burn out the encroaching fir trees and to regenerate the soil. They need us to be digging and tilling the soil. So when we're digging, we're you know, digging up the bigger bulbs and planting back those babies that we might have dug up so that they can grow big um, after we dug up the bigger ones nearby. And these places need us on the land. And of course, due to fire suppression and ongoing settler uh, colonial land practices, it's there's about 3% of the prairies um, that were historically here in our region. And the beautiful thing is there's a lot of reclamation happening. There's lots of inter government, intertribal um, organizational efforts to really just restore natives back to the prairie. You know, there's some prairies that, you know, they'll still spray, spray uh, pesticides or herbicides to um, combat some of the um, invasive species like scotch broom um, because they're more in their, their outlook is like, I want to make sure that, um, we get the scotch broom out and maintain the, the prairie just for prairie sake. And so there's more conversations of like, let's, let's like pause on spraying as much <laughs> so that it's actually a safely um, consumable food for us. And, um, and so um, other examples of cultural ecosystems are um, clam gardens. If anybody has not heard like the beautiful work that's happening at Swinomish, um, they have been restoring a, a clam garden there. So they're um, moving rocks down along their beach to kind of create this little bed that will eventually become a really um, mutually beneficial system for shellfish, fish, and then of course um, um, for harvesting different shellfish. And you know, these are ancient technologies that our ancestors have utilized to create really diverse um, ecosystems that not only benefit ourselves, but for um, um, all relations. And um, I, I saw this quote a couple years ago. I don't know this person, but if you do, I think he, I, I love his quote. Um, An ecosystem isn't whole unless it has its indigenous people on it, um, Philip Brass. And Really, that is is part of that cultural ecosystem. The land needs us, and we need the land. And I think, you know, for the cultural ecosystem, when we when we're sharing that, you know, mostly when we're sharing that um, outside of tribal communities, but even sometimes, you know, I've, I've <clears throat> seen that, you know, in you know some of our uh, tribal people too, is that we're growing up that we're inherently bad for the earth. You know, we get so many messages around why we're so, you know, destructive. And if, if, if no humans were here, everything would just be great. And that's not true. That's not true. Um, it's a bull's end. There's people that are um, definitely wreaking havoc. Corporations are wreaking havoc, the people behind them. And we can be human to the land. We do have a role and responsibility of being a caretaker and a, um, 
and a steward of the earth. And in so many of our um, tribal tribal communities, you know, that that's inherent in our original instructions. You know, I know I hear that um, all the time in my own tribal community and Yakima is like our foods take care of us and in return, we must care for them. You know, those are part of our, you know, unwritten laws to be in that good relationship with the earth. And, um, and it's possible and it's possible to, you know, raise our young people within that, um, within that responsibility. And um, this is one last part about uh, the cultural ecosystem is we have this garden guide. Um, so just how, how might people want to bring in this into their, their classroom or even their backyard. That's something that I'm trying to do. I'm growing um, different berries in my backyard and, and just growing, um, I'm growing camas. And, um, and so this is Shauna Ziert. She's Cow Creek band of Ankwa. And, um, it's just an amazing, um, champion and educator, uh, community educator. And, um, this is, a, a, a what we're calling like a camas prairie mound, like a little micro prairie. So we know, you know, that there's less than 3% of our prairies, uh, here in our region, but what if we took, um, you know, and started to create little prairies in our in our schools, in our communities, in our backyards, and growing some of those prairie plants um, to to ground us in the prairie, to create a space for those pollinators to just build a relationship with those those plants. And so, especially for you know when we're talking to non-native communities and trying to ex explain the importance of camas, um, you know, this is one way that they can engage with that plant. You know, there's several plant nurseries that that grow that plant that they can create these little micro prairies um, to build that relationship. And, um, and we're creating a, a guide right now for taking these two toolkits that we have um, for early childhood. And so this is a quote from Shauna that I took from that toolkit that we're developing. Um, and she's sharing, you know, outdoor experiential culturally informed learning offers endless opportunities for child exploration and discovery child-led teaching uh, moments and emergent learning with plants. And early childhood is when all the realms of human beingness take root in relation to the outdoors. A journey um, that is connected across all time and creation and restoring out light outdoor learning from birth is essential to ecosystem restoration and cultural reclamation. And I was just like, that's, that's what I'm trying to hear say here today. <laughs> My friend already said it, you know, like, how do we start connecting back our children back to the land from the beginning? And, you know, those are those are ways that I know are already embedded in our our tribal communities. Um, I'm sure there's there's um, many ways that it shows up for you all here. Um, one thing that I always really love um, that's a practice in our own community, um, in our longhouse is when they have um, our root feast, they have. Uh, a little baby's first foods ceremony, and um, so the ba all the new babies uh, try our our traditional foods, our you know our, our salmon, our deer, our roots, and our berries, and they all get a little taste of that food for the first time, and and they say that it helps to acclimate the babies to their lands, to their homelands, and so you know there's different practices um, for you to just you know continue to practice in your own lives that probably come from your own um, diverse backgrounds. But um, I just firmly believe like getting our kids connected from birth. And so our, our other curriculum um, <clears throat> is plant teachings for growing social emotional skills. And this is really about how plants teach us to be healthy and resilient. Um, this is a collaboration between Grub and the Northwest Indian treatment center that's um, led by the Squaxin Island tribe. And um, it's a, it's a amazing toolkit that um, comes with a book. So um, this, this page right here is, is the, is the front cover of the book and the book um, has, it has, um, oops, sorry, 22 plants, I think. And each plant, um, has two pages where it just you know kind of shares like how to how to identify it, um, its gifts, medicine, 
and um, some sort of recipe with it. And then what is, what is its teaching? What is the inherent teaching from that plant? And so um, like a plant like willow, um, that's very, you know, flexible, but strong. Like how can we, um, it's, it's one of its social emotional teachings is about flexibility. And it's not only about being flexible, you know, in our bodies, but also in our mindsets, like, you know, not being really stuck in our ways. Like how can we have an open mind and to be open to hearing people's ideas and not just being so single-mindedness, but being really flexible in how we think. And so, um, each plant has some of those gifts and then we're working on an activity guide that will also go along with this that really dives deeper into um, some of that social emotional learning and worksheets that you can do alongside of it. Um, this is all available on our website. You can order the book um, on the portal, um, but the book is just the first part of the book is on there. Um, and then so to get the full book, you really got to order the hard copy. And it accompanies with little cards, little handheld cards, um, posters. So that licorice fern you see is a poster and it has kind of just the main point of um, the plant and its gifts and um, the Lachute seed and Clallum words for it. And then we have movement videos that were made by um, Shinoe Gawa, who is in the top right of this photo. And Shinoe is uh, Lumian's Clallum. And, um, just has so many gifts. Uh, she's an amazing singer, but in the movement videos, she's really like she studied Qigong and yoga and different movement arts. And so there's, um, you know, like one on Hawthorne, and Hawthorne is such an amazing plant medicine for our heart. And so she'll kind of guide us through movements that might open up our heart or um, kind of. Um, work on our cardiovascular system and um those are all available um on on the curriculum portal and on um our, our wild foods and medicines website and i'm not looking at the chat at all so I, have no I, I put yeah i put the links up for you mariana and i got so interested in your conversation i forgot to give you a time check uh 15 minutes ago but it's 150 right now just so okay. So you have an idea of that, but I've been um, keeping up and putting putting in those links to um, to grub wild foods and medicines, the native plants and foods curriculum portal, and the uh, video library. Thank you, appreciate it. Um, so I'm going to move along because this is what happens. I'm like so excited to share the what, but I want to get into like um, or the how. How how did this all come about? But I want to dive into a little bit of you know what it is. Um, so of course, when you're working with kids, waking up our animal sen senses, the art of noticing, um, what, what we call it. Um, this is one way that I like to bring language into when I'm working with my, my kids. Um, so, um, you know, when we have our owl eyes, I'll say, uh, you know, like, what are we seeing? What can we see? Like, you know, always, you know, we can even like put our hands out and try to see um, even in that peripheral vision, like how far our vision is as we're entering into the forest or the trail for a walk or putting on our Yamash Mishu, um, our deer ears um, to really listen. Our uh, Nusuk Nishnu, um, our salmon nose, what are we smelling? Um, and I don't know the words for the other ones, but, you know, our fox feet, you know, this is so helpful when you're bringing kids out um, to tread lightly. Foxes can be just so like light, lightly treading, you know, this can be helpful if you're taking kids out to saltwater beaches and you don't want them to crunch, crunch, crunch on everything. Um, your snake scents, you know, snakes can like, you know, move into the warmer and cooler areas and they just have such an ability to, um, find the temperature that they like. And then our bunny taste buds, like find out what plants are safe for kids to try and encourage them to be brave um, and try that food. Um, and bunnies, you know, have such a wide range of taste buds and try to nibble, nibble, and see, um, uh, bring them into that experience. Um, and there's more, um, there's a whole video that we talk about the art of noticing and 
um, you know, our goal is that our kids can look out into the forest and not just see a sea of green, but they, they see these plant relatives. They see all these different um, plants living together in community. And, um, you know, that there's, there's the alder like creating this nice canopy for that little baby cedar that's going to grow and eventually outlive that alder. And they see, you know, that not only like who they are, but their gifts and their gifts in, in their environment and their gifts that they can be in their life. Um, they say that, or there's a statistic that the average American 10 year old um, can identify like over a thousand advertising logos, but less than 10 regional native plants and animals. And in contrast in Ecuador, a six year old girl could identify um, a thousand plants with just a part of their leaf. And so we have that capability to really see um, and differentiate, you know, our, our natural world. And it's just about stewarding that and connecting and connecting to that art of noticing because it's, it's in within us. It's possible. Um, so um, with the last little bit of time, I'm going to share about nettles. And nettle, um, nettle helps build inner strength. So that's part of their social emotional teaching. And I'm going to actually start with a story and, um, and then get a little bit in, into nettle um, off that story. And that's another value within our whole curricula is um, in both plant teachings and tend is weaving, weaving stories throughout. So there's several Northwest Native storytellers that have gifted stories to the curriculum that um, are gifted with permission and encouraged for us to learn and share um, because that's part of our indigenous ways of transferring knowledge is, is embedded in our stories. So the story I learned from Roger Fernandez, who's a lower Elwa Clallam, and um, the story goes a long time ago. The people here, the people in the Coast Salish region live lives of fear. The people were always afraid. And the thing that they were most afraid of, the thing that scared them the most, were these people that came in these big war canoes from the north. And the people that came in those big war canoes from the north wreaked havoc on the lives of the people here. They killed them. They took them back to the north as slaves. They burned their villages down. They took their food. And they made their lives here miserable. And that's why the people live lives of fear. And one day, a man from the village said, this isn't right. I don't want my people to live lives of fear. Something must be done. And so before he went to bed, he, he prayed and he asked for guidance. And that night he had a dream. And in the dream, a plant came to him and it was nettle. And nettle said in the springtime, I want you to gather my, my leaves. When I'm small, I want you to gather my leaves, dry them, make them into a tea, give that tea to everyone in the, in the village. And as everyone is drinking my tea, I want you to have them say, I'll be strong for my ancestors, I'll be strong for my people, and I'll be strong for the ones to come. The man did this. He woke from the dream, shared the dream with everyone in the village, and they did as the dream instructed. In the spring, they gathered the nettle leaves, dried them, made a tea, drank that tea together. And as they drank the tea, they said, I'll be strong for my ancestors, I'll be strong for my people, I'll be strong for the ones to come. And the people grew stronger. Time passed and that man had another dream. Nettle came back and Nettle came back and <clears throat> in the dream, they said, uh, when I grow taller in the fall, when my stocks grow taller, I want you to gather your strongest men and women warriors. And I want you to gather them and have them take my body and have them whip themselves, whip themselves. And as my medicine is entering their body, I want you to have them say, I'll be strong for my ancestors. I'll be strong for my people. I'll be strong for the ones to come. And so the man awoke from the dream. He shared the dream with everyone in the village again. And they did as this dream instructed. They gathered their strongest men and women warriors. In the fall, when the stalks grew tall, they got those stalks, they whipped themselves, and they said those words. And they grew stronger. One day they got word that, that that canoe was coming down from the north, that big war canoe. And instead of running back into the forest of prey, like they had done before, they all went down to the beach. Everyone in the village, from the babies, elders, everyone in between, went down to the beach and they stood in one long line, shoulder to shoulder. 
And as they stood in one long line, shoulder to shoulder, in one voice, they sang their warrior song. And as that war canoe approached, they saw the people united in one line, singing their warrior song, and they turned around because they knew that the people could no longer be defeated. And that story is called Hell Nettles Save the People. And that was all. So I, um, I love that story. It's one of my favorite stories of all time. And, you know, like all of our stories, they have so much to teach us. Um, and um, I welcome anybody, if you, if you want to share something that you got out of that story, to, to share in the chat. Because um, <clears throat> I think that we all learn. I, I love hearing um, what, what shows up for people um, in our stories as, as something that they might need to hear that day. And um, connecting that story to kids. Um, well, you know, just connecting kids and stories. It's like they go together. Um, you know, that's how I've been able to really connect um, my child with with gathering. So this this is a picture of um, on the top left. It's my son Ayut when he was like two months old, and then on the on the top right, he's uh, four years old. And on the top right, we were we were planning to get nettles to um, harvest as a first food for for my one year old, and uh, well, he was like six or seven months at the time. And like, that was the goal. That's what we're doing. And, and, you know, suddenly just wasn't that interested. And, and I was just like, come on, you know, so it, it waxes and wanes, you know, when kids are interested and excited to gather. And, and I was like, do you remember the story? Do you remember how nettles save the people, how make nettles make us strong? And he's like, really in the, like, I want to be strong. I want to run really fast. And so he was, became really interested in the story. And then we shared the story with him. And then Immediately, he was like, "Where's nettle? Where, where, where do I get nettle? Can we get some nettle?" And, um, and I just love that, you know, like um, that story, that specific day, helped my child gather some nettles as a first food for for his little brother. Um, and um, and nettles, you know, are just an amazing plant. Um, there, um, I feel like it, it's it's one of those plants that really lifts up our indigenous science, and in, like in, in that story specifically, um, how nettles made people strong, and that's really what it does in our body. You know, we have um, in our wild food traditions module, we have this really cool um, nutritional analysis, and it kind of shows like how much more nutritional nettles and chickweed and dandelion, like different native and wild foods are in comparison to like spinach and kale, which is kind of what we look for is the most nutritional greens at the grocery store. And um, though it's amazing to see like those numbers of like how, how much calcium and how much magnesium and how all these different minerals that are in um, nettles to make us literally stronger. But that story is 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 the teaching like you know that dream that that's that's our indigenous science of, of already knowing that nettles makes us strong um and so nettles um in the spring can be gathered as a as a food and you can you know denature those things cooking them or doing a, a blanching you can gather them when they're a little bit taller before they go to seed um when they get more fibrous for a tea and then here's a picture of them and their seeds that's kind of what's happening right now in my region and you can take those seeds and they're edible and then it's also fiber so you can take it um and make cordage out of it and traditionally here there were um fishnets made uh, out of nettle and um and this is some of that nettle um social emotional learning it's it's hey wake up my sting reminds you to pause breathe and observe your inner state if you move towards this experience with love and awareness, you can build inner strength. And then all of our social emotional um, learning for each plant has different questions for, for self-reflection. Um, and um, I'm at 11, but I have to do one more like little plant pain talk. So <laughs> we're going to go a little bit over. So a little less time for questions. Um, but um Plantain is a plant that grows like it's we have native species here for us, uh, but the one that we see everywhere is this is called frogleaf plantain or we have um, 
on the top or on the left is the longleaf plantain. And we say that plantain teaches us about self-soothe because it's this soothing medicine that's kind of everywhere, you know, like just downtown Olympia and there's some growing outside of the sidewalk um, completely surrounded by concrete. So it's, it's um, that teaching that soothing medicine can be everywhere. And um, plantain um, can be made as a poultice. Um, so here's um, a few different ways of using plantain as a poultice. Um, that, that bigger picture of the hand is like chewing up the plantain leaf and putting it on like a cut, a wound, an insect bite. Um, and it can help um, really draw out the infection while sealing and healing the wound. Or um, on the top, right is is like steaming it a little bit so you're softening up the plant kind of opening up the cell walls and then placing it on the on the wound and you can also use it as a band-aid so this is my kid's foot on the left um and so he got a little cut and we put a little pitch because pitch um from our trees it heals them and their wounds and it also can heal us and so it can be like a little antimicrobial healing salve or not it's not sad, so sticky, but you can put that pitch on and then you can put like a little plantain leaf as like a little band-aid. Um, and we often talk about plantain as Indian band-aid here. Um, and it's it's one of those plants that I feel like berries and plantain are like gateway plants for kids. Like they're just, you know, get so excited. Plantain's really safe. You know, it's a safe plant for them to chew up and put on their owie and, and it's so empowering um, to be able to just know um, what to do when you get a little cut because that happens all the time once they're running around. And, um, and of course, berries, like every, every kid is and babies are excited about berries. Um, and so plantain teaches us about self soothe It says, I am called Indian Band-Aid because I draw out infections and heal wounds. You can find me anywhere from fields to driveways Touch my leaves and feel how smooth I am. Chew me up, place me on a wound, drink my tea to soothe irritation. How can I soothe myself through smelling, touching, tasting, or listening to something that calms me? How can I be my own band-aid? And so really um, connecting that plantain is, is, you know, teaching us that one soothing medicine can be all around us and, and really connecting to what what soothes me, what, what is, can be supportive to me in times of stress when I need to find my medicine. Um, <clears throat> and um, this is one, like in terms of that, that social emotional learning piece, um, I'm going to stop share. This is my last, last like thing I want to say is, um, you know, we want our kids to, to be connected to place and plants and, you know, one day my children won't be in my home and I will want them to be able to, to see plantain and know that there's soothing medicine there for them or to see wild rose and, and feel that grace and protection that wild rose um, offers us. And so it's also about connecting kids to how these plants can really hold them, even maybe when they're far away from home and they don't have their community. So. Um, so much. Thank you for letting me chat. And I will. So the last thing, getting connected with us, there's the website, Wild Foods and Medicines uh, website, and um, you can get connected to the portal from there. Um, and then they also put in like the direct portal and that has all of our curricula resources. And I see there's a Q&A. All right. Thank you so much. Uh, I just um, opened it up to let everyone know um, if they want to put some questions in the in the Q and A section or uh, in the chat. Um, we can start looking at those, and and I posted throughout the the links um, as we're waiting for people to put their chats in there. When uh, I I don't know if you can see it come on the blur mode. Oh no. Oh wait, there maybe is it going to do it? There, I got the I got the book, the plant teachings book, and the cards that it comes along with. Um, 
Mariana and I were in the Changemaker Fellowship together. And so as soon as I found out you were working on that curriculum with others, I ordered that book in the cards. So I've had it for some time now and, and really love it. It's really inspiring um, to, to have that um, in our community. We're working on curriculum as well. So um, I, I really loved um, looking at the, the way you've organized this um, and the thought that was put into it. Uh, so I really, I really recommend that for people that are, are doing curriculum in their own communities um, or want, uh, want to use this curriculum to, um, to use in their classrooms. Um, I, I really love how you talked about the, uh, the plants um, and protecting them from being used in ways like I, I guess that's the thing that, that we often come across in different communities that I've organized in is like how much do we share about the plants and their medicines and how much do we keep away and I really appreciated your tape on that and I just was wondering how you came to consensus with that with within your community what that process was um, with your with your elders and everyone on what what to put out there and what not if you want to elaborate a little on that I find that really interesting and um, useful. Yes, I think it's a really big and constantly ongoing question on like, what's, what's okay to share. Um, <clears throat> our team is really big. Um, and so some of that work already happened. Um, some of the resources that are developed kind of already were coming up from resources that had been developed. Um, uh, Valerie Seagrass from Muckleshoot and Elise Crone, who's not native, but they had those two have like, work together on many, many curricular resources before um, these ones came about. Some of the like cultural pieces of uh, what's intended were things that they already had worked on for several years, um, working with different um, tribal elders in various communities to um, decide what's what's safe to share. And so, um, and we've, we've um, so I think that there's like, I don't know, generational before me <laughs> uh, uh, background on that. And then ongoing, you know, we're always, um, it's kind of like 10 is up there. It's up there on the website, but we are constantly updating it. We're constantly getting feedback and expanding it. Or, you know, even just the, the reason why we have a curriculum portal is because before um, COVID, we did teacher trainings. And so how the work gets out there is we do a lot of direct service contract with tribes. Our primary audience and focus is tribal communities. Um, though here, um, you know, in Olympia, because we're here, there's lots of um, schools and local programs that are using the curriculum in other schools, um, especially the plant teachings for growing social emotional skills have gotten a pretty wide range. Um, but it's, 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 um, it's a slow worthwhile process. <laughs> I feel like it's a, it could be a longer whole other talk. Um, and, and I think the thing is, is that I'm sitting here saying this, you can look at our teacher guide and see who those elders are, who those cultural um, specialists and people that really led us. And that doesn't mean that there aren't people that are not going to be okay with it. And that's just, that's just what it is. Um, and, um, and I think everybody's, you know, right in their own way. And I did see a question in the chat from Tatiana saying, when it comes to medicine making with students, how does the structure for those classes work? Um, I'm at a farm school um, and interested in herbalism and sharing that with children. So um, how do I answer quickly? It's, it's, it's really adaptable. The whole curriculum is meant to be really adaptable. And we've done, um, lots of outdoor learning um, with people. So it's like one of our favorite things is to make rose hip jam. So we'll take like the dry de-seeded rose hips, some apple juice, you powder the dry de-seeded rose hips with like a spice grinder and then you add the apple juice. And I've done that in conference rooms. I've done that. All I need is power cord. Um, or I've been in the middle of like the forest at Muckleshoot and we're making like, um, you know, mortar, pestle, some yarrow powder to go in a little baggie, you know, so th there's, there's, I guess, once you dive in, I think you'll probably be able to pull out what 
what's possible. Um, if you have early childhood learners, we are um, hopefully by next month, it'll be on our portal, but it'll be um, an activity guide for merging both our toolkits for early learners. And, um, and a lot of it will be like really simple activity like that. Um, but there's, like I could just talk a lot about every question and I'm just going to say there's so much in there. You're welcome. Um, I, I don't know if my email got put in the chat. I didn't want to put it up on the screen because it's, I think this is recorded. Um, so I didn't want it recorded forever. Um, but you can put my email in the chat and you're welcome to just ask really specific questions about the resources. I'm not getting it now. I'm putting your um, all the info back into the chat again, just so um, people don't have to scroll up for it. And um, that has your your email at the very bottom, and um, the other websites where you can access it. Um, I think some of the questions that you saw, I somehow am not seeing. So, yeah, if you see any other ones that are there. Yeah, I just looked at the Q and A. If there was a chat question, feel free to okay it again. Um, do you have any resources for Ohio region? So um, we know that there's people that are using our resources in really different regions, um, and <clears throat> they're just kind of the curriculum is meant to be really adaptable. So even when I'm sharing about like, there's a lot of plant knowledge that's not in here. So Muckleshoot Tribal School uses our social emotional learning um, as their like adopted SEL learning for their school. And, and because they're in a tribal school, they, they might take some of their Muckleshoot plant knowledge and share that in their classrooms. So it's like, it's meant to just kind of be the starting point and then you can go deeper. So you can see, um, you know, plants that are likely there, like mint and yarrow and rose and nettle, and um, use that as like a little bit of a starting point and, and go deeper. If there's something that's really um, like a regionally specific story. Um, so it's, it's also meant to be just kind of an inspirational for, for other um, models. And I forgot the last thing I wanted to say. Um, it, we have a lot. Um, so I apologize if, if it's like too much <laughs> to share at once. We have a queer connected learning toolkit. So um, that's also on the website. And I just feel like it's important because when we're talking to young people and we want to, you know, they are getting excited about trees, like we interview. So the toolkit's geared for native, native use. And so uh, like we'll interview a tribal forester and a tribal forest educator and like what is their career path? What do they love about their job? How did they get there? What did they need to get there? Um, and we have one for all of our modules. So for like, while our, for our herbal apothecary, we interview um, uh, a native uh, herbalist and a midwife. Um, and so each one has people that we interview and like career highlights that you can do um, because it's important, you know, as we, um, you know, there's jobs that were never available. You know, the job that I have now, that wasn't a job my dad could have, you know, in the 60s and 70s. Like, we want to make sure people know, like, there's so much possibility. All right. I see that other question in the chat. I'll let you read that. And I'm uh, just going to ask Mariah if you want to put the link to the... Um, <laughs> yeah, the survey. There we go. I'm like blanking out the name. Yeah, put the link in the survey for everyone. Um, and also, we will pick a name for the goodie box for Clayton. Um, if uh, Mariah, you want to pick that name out, and you can um, put it there so we can contact that person. I think their email, we have their email, right? So we just need their name and we can let them know. Yes. Um, in the chat. Okay. Okay, great. So. Um, that's kind of closing end of business right there, but I, I want to give time for this this question by getting some of that business stuff out of the way. And if you have time to fill out that survey. Um, and um, let me switch over to um, also let you know that the next webinar um, is going to be with Rainbow Lopez on September 12th. 
and she's a nutritional therapy practitioner out of Tucson, Arizona. And uh, I will put the links um, and again, uh, check out the survey. And we will um, pick that name and I'm going to turn it back over to Mariana so she can answer that last question that was in the chat. And we'll just keep going until um, 2.30 with questions. And if there's anything you wanted to, to say, Mariah, as well with the, the survey or anything, you can break in on that too. Yeah, so I shared my screen just to let you all know that we generated a number for the person who um, stuck around for this presentation. And Magdalena Rodriguez called your your our uh our winner <laughs> so um i believe we have your email address so we'll send over that um goodie goodie bag and um just a reminder to take the survey to help us make these of more of a cl inclusive experience and for general feedback and just for topics you'd probably want to hear in the future um, this is our 10 part webinar series. So the next one that's going to be coming back up will be in September on the 12th. And it's going to be talking about, <clears throat> it's going to be with Rainbow Lopez on uh, nutritional therapy, practitioner and an ancestral food educator. So that's Rainbow Lopez. So stick around for that and follow us on Instagram and Facebook. Those are where we usually post these. But thank you so much, all. Uh, and I and this is recorded. It will also be up on um, NASA's website within a few days. And the previous uh, episodes of this uh, webinar are also up there already. And they're so good. I've already shared. <laughs> yeah. Um, All right. Go go ahead, Mariana. I'll pass it back over to you now. Yeah. Um, I wish I wish none of these questions feel easy, <laughs> which is great. Um, but. It's, um, just like how do you start with a culturally based curriculum I think just um, looking for the stories um, in your community I, I mean one one framework can be just looking at what ours looks like and just using that as as a framework if it feels like it might work for you um, and like for for the nettle story um, you know, nettles um, are such a big teacher. And so, you know, that story kind of becomes the framework for, for some of the lesson. Like how, how does nettles make us stronger? Like let's, let's make a tea, let's um, ground ourselves. And um, um, so some, some of it is like the culture can be the leader and, and how um, you're, you're wanting to develop something. Um, and um, and just letting our our own indigenous um, science and uh, gifts be be the leader in in that. I think um, what's been really uh, fulfilling is is sometimes when I want to be really bold, there's like, yeah, just put it in there because I'm like, you know, mountain huckleberry is a plant that a lot of people know, but it's over harvested. Like we should probably just tell people like they if you're not from this community, like or from, you know, like if you're non-native, like we need to just say that maybe the best thing to do is to grow evergreen huckleberry, a different variety that grows really well in your garden for you to have access to huckleberry. Um, and so I think um, being bold in, in what, what you want to put out there um, and um, letting, letting the culture shine. I, um, <laughs> I, I feel sheepish answering this because I am one of a very big team of people um, that have created this. And honestly, I feel like I'm, you know, like maybe the, the pinky nail in, in a whole team of people on this hand that have, you know, like um, been a part of this. So I think if I had one of my sister friends in here, she could answer it way better. Um, but I'm so excited for you and hope it's a good, good process. I wish you luck. And, it, and patience is, would be my other thing. <laughs> I, I think as, as someone who's just starting out um, creating, well, I've been creating curriculum for a while with a lot of the herbal work that I do. And that's, that's taught, um, usually, it's usually taught off screen and out of books. I'm just, you know, in the classroom with indigenous students with herbal things. But now that we're creating curriculum pieces, like broadening this idea of curriculum as well, like you talk about these stories. So like we're, we're starting out to um, like, 
sitting down in casual ways, not just not just in set up ways to sit down with elders and with youth, um, collecting experiences and stories surrounding plant based knowledge um, and just looking at that whole community as knowledge keepers and bringing them in. And I, I think you touched on that with it. We're teaching the children like we're also learning from them, just like the plants. It's not a one way connection. The plants are our teachers. And the plants are also learning from us and they're remembering us when we connect with them. And I think that's how all the knowledge keepers in our communities are. They, you know, people that want to share and want to um, want to pass these ideas on for the next generation um, want to be talked to. They want to be nourished. They, um, they want to be tended to. They want their stories to be tended to. And uh, I, that's like a place where I, I really love starting with curriculum is are, are these things that are passed on verbally and don't always end up in our books um, and then using the curriculum to start the stories. Like you said, those, those beginning plants that you put in those books are ways to get people excited to want to talk to their parents, their grandparents, their aunts and uncles um, about, about these things that go deeper into our very specific ecosystems that we have that are, that are very different from the East coast to the West coast and the North and the South. Um, that was beautiful, Nicole. I feel like that's right. You can answer that one. <laughs> so Zoe sh- added a question. Do you have any recommendations for teaching in urban settings? And as you said, this is very adaptable, but I found urban green spaces have additional barriers. This kind of work. So true. Um, yeah. Um, I think, not Ilahi Fund in Seattle is doing such incredible work. They're an urban-based indigenous women-led organization um, doing lots of land restoration and just really cool um, partnerships uh, with the city. I know that there's some people that um, work to make sure like to not spray in certain places or um, I think even the city of Seattle is even trying to work on how to, I don't know, I don't have the right words and I don't know if I know everything to say it, but like kind of like create um, uh, less barriers for people to just gather, you know, because I don't know if it's even legal in some of the parks, but also, you know, creating um, ordinances so they're not, they're not using all the different um, spraying and um, it's possible, you know, I think it's just when I lived in Seattle, which is more densely populated than here in Olympia, um, you know, you just have to get to know like where, where, where can I gather where, you know, um, you know, where is it going to be safe? You know, we always say like not next to road, busy roadsides or of course dog parks and cities and, um, you know, places that have been sprayed with pesticides or besides, and, you know, when we look, it's not to say that we don't have those precautions when it comes to gathering um, about the different, um, you know, pollutants that might be on our foods. But if we compare like a McDonald's cheeseburger and all of the different GMO ingredients and all the different, you know, layers of pesticide that might have been sprayed on all those things. And, you know, we're, you know, I'm, I'm here downtown and might find a Himalayan blackberry because it grows everywhere here. There's still great berries. Um, even though it's next to the road, it's likely better than, than worrying about that McDonald's cheeseburger. So there's, there's almost like this really fine line of like, especially in urban settings, um, gathering um, where, where it feels safe. Um, and um, I, I think maybe just checking out Mala Ilahi and I don't know exactly what is, is available on their website, but they're, they've just been doing such inspiring collaborative work with the city of Seattle in growing, you know, they, they're doing tons of restoration in partnership with the um, um, park. And now that I'm saying that there's lots of actually native organizations, the native community led things. Um, Shauna Zierk, who I mentioned earlier, the native gathering garden in Portland, they like restored, it was a brown field. And they restored it um, completely, you know, to this place where they can gather food. So they're growing camas, they're growing berries. And, and it's this um, space that usually literally used to be a brownfield that's um, now a thriving space for Native community in Portland. Um, so 
I think there's lots of models to be inspired by, um, like different food forests and things um, that people are restoring in the cities so that there is access. And then you just got to find your pocket. Sometimes I'm driving and like, ooh, what did I see over there? (laughs) It looks like there's uh, one more question um, that we can address. We have about four minutes left and then we, we can we can end with that one. I think I think I I think I did it. Oh, whoops! Yeah, maybe you did. Okay, that was the from Tatiana. Uh, yes, or um, okay. Zoe. Zoe's question I just did. Okay, and then um, the medicine making with students. Um, Wait. When does it come to medicine? When it comes to medicine making with students, how does the structure for those classes work? I am a farm school educator interested in herbalism and sharing that knowledge with children, but I'm unsure of how to navigate teaching it in the classroom. Yeah, I ans- I answered that. I mean, I could I could keep okay. talking, but I won't. So. <laughs> okay. All right. It looks like we got to the to the end of those questions, and um, I just want to finish by thanking you so much for for joining us and talking about. Uh, how you're working in your community with health and wellness and uh, inspiring us all with these stories so that we can um, think more deeply about uh, how we're working with our youth and our children. And um, I uh, want to make sure that we got all the close of business. So if Mariah needs to break in, she can. And I just want to give you um, space to close and say goodbye to everyone. Thank you so much for inviting me. Um, I'm re- really inspired by the work that you all carry. And uh, thank you, everybody that um, came to hear uh, me share. Um, this is literally what um, I love most in my life is talking about my kids and how we go and gather and do fun stuff and share it uh, with, with our community. So um, thank you for engaging with me. and. Um, And just much respect and love to all of you.